I got back in time. On the night of 1 October, the enemy went on the offensive. Fierce fighting began on the left flank of the Bryant's front troops. It was still quiet in our area, but intelligence noted the arrival of new enemy units, including tank units. It became clear that not today, tomorrow, we would have to repel the onslaught of Hitlerites. I sent almost all the workers of the political department to the units and subdivisions, but it had times where possible party meetings with the adjunct about the tasks of the communists in the defensive battle, to speak to the soldiers about loyalty to military duty, about our capital Moscow, which we had the honor to defend, about steadfastness in defense. I also advised that participants of the battles for Senno should address the young soldiers. In addition, the workers of the political department were instructed to check the correctness of the distribution of party forces in the units. Bayata Alexievich, among other things, was concerned about the rear. He ordered me to send one of the workers. I myself went to the tank regiment to talk to the soldiers, to find out their moods, to instruct the political officers. The mood of the tankers was uplifted. They had just received the newspaper Pravda with a report on the anti-fascist youth rally held in Moscow. Hero of the Soviet Union, I, Prashi, I spoke at the rally on behalf of the tank soldiers. In the newspaper was placed his portrait. Battalion Commissar Pobinsky did not wait for instructions. Before my arrival, he had already managed to gather the political commander of companies, grassroots agitators, instruct. I was once again convinced that in the first tank commander and commissar are like each other, both in their place. In the morning of October 1, the enemy's long-range artillery opened fire on the defense line of the 16th Army. At night, the shelling intensified, and the next day Hitlerites began to attack from the area of Dukovshina. Large forces of infantry and tanks were thrown against us. As it became known later, it was the beginning of the general offensive of fascists on Moscow. Although we were preparing to repel the enemy onslaught, we could not hold it back. By the end of October, two fascist troops broke through the front at the junction between the 30th and neighboring with us, 19th armies, and advanced 10-15 kilometers. The front command took measures to eliminate the breakthrough. Counterattacks were carried out by the forces of the 30th and 19th armies and reserves, united under the command of General Boldin. In this regard, our brigade was transferred to the 19th Army. In the evening, I, together with the chief of staff of the brigade, Major Egonov, came to the commander of the 19th Army, Lieutenant General M. A. F. Nukin in the forest, southeast of the state farm near Lyon. Mikhail Fedorovich is over 50. There is a noticeable gleam of grey in his hair. He has an attentive, understanding look of a man who has seen a lot in his life. Lukin is an old party member, a participant in the Civil War. The general asked us a few questions, but listened to the answers absent-mindedly. As it seems, his thoughts were occupied with other things. With the instincts of an experienced commander, Lukin understood that the situation of the army was becoming more and more alarming. He was not afraid of danger, but soberly assessed the situation. Commander and a member of the military council of the army, Sheklanov, could not tell us anything comforting. The ratio of forces continued to remain in favor of the enemy, and our counterattacks were not successful. But tomorrow we will continue our attempts to close the breakthrough, said Lukin, but it was felt that he himself did not believe too much in the possibility of success. And indeed, the next day the enemy managed to expand the front of the breakthrough, and from the flanks deeply enveloped a significant part of the troops of several of our armies. By order of the military council of the front, the 16th Army withdrew, transferring its compounds to the 20th and 19th armies. And the enemy ring was about to close. It was necessary for us to organize a quick withdrawal, but we did not have time to withdraw. We had to fight in an encirclement near the river Vopitz, behind the state farm near Lova. The situation was unclear. Our losses were growing. All this reminded me of the beginning of the war, the 31st Tank Division, Colonel Kolikovich. On the night of 6 October, the brigade concentrated on the edge of the forest. They expected at dawn to break the encirclement ring with a sudden blow. In the darkness, the commander, the brigade commissar and I, with the chief of staff, set up tanks, distributed on the cars of the soldiers of the motorized rifle battalion, which were to act as a tank landing. It was getting a little bit lighter in the east, when we, having finished all the preparations, sat down on the grass to have a quick snack before the battle. Suddenly the sounds of music, muffled by the distance, reached us. It was almost unbelievable. The pre-dawn gloom, the blue mist on the edge of the forest, the wary silence, and suddenly music. No, 
Damn it, they found time to have fun. Who started it? General Remazov was indignant. Nurse as well. Perhaps the enemy has it. Ye, having listened to it, the chief of the special department, senior political officer Shandrikov suggested. Nonsense. Some of our men took an unwise initiative, deciding to raise the mood in this way. Mmm. Objected Commissar Soloviev. They must have started a gramophone. No. The music comes from the Germans. Shandrikov stood his ground. We interrupted our breakfast and went to the edge of the forest. Having taken shelter in a dense bush, I brought binoculars to my eyes and saw that, about half a kilometre away from us, up to a regiment of Hitlerites was lining up on the field. It is necessary to warn our men not to give themselves away. He, said General Remizov. Let them leave, it will be easier for us to break through. But the Germans were not going anywhere, but simply decided to carry out a mental attack. We understood it when they turned in three thick chains and under the cracking of drums moved towards the forest, where our thinning units were hiding. Why did the fascists resort to such a brazen demonstration? The enemy were approaching. They were marching at full height without firing. Drums were cracking fractionally, and under their anxious murmuring sounds Hitler's soldiers were diligently typing a step, knocking down dew with heavy boots. The fog dissipated imperceptibly, and on the field where the soldiers passed, freshly trampled paths were clearly visible in the tall grass. Don't shoot, only don't shoot before the time. Worried Remizov, seized by the excitement of the hunt. The enemy's psychic attack did not frighten us in the least. On the contrary, we were getting an opportunity to teach the enemy a serious lesson. The enemy chains quickened their step and then ran. Remizov was waiting for this moment. At his command simultaneously opened fire and tankers and gunners. Our bullets mowed down the fascists without mercy. The first chain fell at once, the second and third. Trembled, mixed. Engines of fighting vehicles roared. Remizov and Solovive hid in the turrets of tanks. I jumped up on the armor with the machine gunners. The soldiers barely had time to reload their weapons. Mechanic drivers crushed the enemy tracks. It was a terrible sight. The field, which only a few minutes ago was pleasing to the eye with thick dewy grass, was now strewn with wide tank tracks. Killed fascists were lying everywhere. The wounded were moaning. Bright bloodstains were scarlet on the crumpled grass. We learnt the reason for the unwise mental attack from the testimony of the prisoners. It turns out that the fascists did not assume that there were tanks in the forest. They thought that they were defended by a small number of scattered groups of Red Army soldiers, which could be easily dealt with in one blow. Before the attack, Hitler's soldiers were given schnapps, and after the battle they promised a two-day rest. The miscalculation cost the Nazis dearly. Having destroyed almost completely up to two battalions of infantry, the brigade broke out of the ring and restored communication with the task force of the headquarters of the 19th Army. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, but as it soon became clear, it was too early to rejoice. It seemed that we had broken through one, and there was a second ring of encirclement. The military council of the 19th Army held an urgent meeting. To it were invited commanders, commissars and chiefs of political departments of compounds. The question was discussed, what to do next? After a long debate it was decided that our brigade would be the first to break through the encirclement ring and the rifle units would organize defense on the flanks of the breakthrough. We drew up a schedule for the withdrawal of units. Each commander wanted to withdraw his unit faster. The commander looked outwardly completely calm. This courageous, never losing his composure, probably better than others understood how difficult to implement the decision and therefore patiently listened to the considerations of his subordinates, trying to weigh and provide for everything. Returning to the location of the brigade, General Remizov said to Solovayev, I feel in my heart that there will be no use out of this idea. Everything seems to be rightly decided, but when it comes to the case, confusion will begin. I have heard how some people argue. You see, they need to go out in the first place. Nobody wants to cover the flanks. What if we fight our way out ourselves, Piotr? Let the others follow us. I didn't expect partisanship from you, Peter Alexeyevich objected angrily. I do not agree to such an option. It is necessary to strike with a fist, not with spread fingers. Well, well, we'll see. Remazov pressed his lips together. For several days the brigade fought in the area of the villages of Bogoroditskoye and Obukovo, piercing the passage of rifle units. We had only twelve tanks left. 
especially persistent was the battle on 12 October. At noon, reconnaissance found up to two dozen heavy and medium tanks of the enemy. They were blocking our way to Bogorodetskoy. General Remazov shifted his cap on the back of his head. Hmm, twenty tanks. That's a lot, but we'll try to get through. The enemy did not wait for our approach, but attacked us himself. His tanks turned round and moved forward, waving long barrels of guns as if sniffing. The commissar of the regiment, Shepitov, with a slightly pale but resolute face, leaned out of the turret and waved his hand invitingly. The heavy hatch cover slammed shut with a clang, and a brown cloud rose up behind the stern of the vehicle. Our enemy tanks were getting closer. I was sitting with the machine gunners on the armour of one of the thirty kevers, holding tightly to the bracket on the turret. The mechanic driver drove the car at high speed. It was bouncing heavily on the uneven field. The enemy was firing from a long distance. Shrapnel shells began to burst on our right and left. The machine gunners' peas fled to the ground, lay down in the ravine, letting the tanks pass ahead. I also jumped down, lay down in a shallow, fresh crater. The ground is damp. My overalls on my chest and elbows got wet at once. A young soldier lying on my left prepared a grenade and inserted the fuse. The machine guns were crackling angrily dryly. I took my pistol out of my holster. Our tanks bravely went at the enemy, firing from the move and from short stops. Here one enemy vehicle turned on the spot, having lost a track, another tilted, almost bumping into the ground with a gun barrel. The third one had black smoke pouring from the transmission compartment. One of the commanders raised the machine gunners from the ground with an imperious whistle. The soldiers rushed after the tanks. A hurrah was heard, drowned out by gunshots. In front, a tank battalion Commissar Shepatov, with a clearly visible number 14. Suddenly it stopped as if it had run into some invisible obstacle. There was a strong explosion, and the tank was enveloped in smoke. Mud of the crew jumped out of the hatches of the burning machine. So died Shepatov. Unable to withstand our onslaught, the enemy tankers turned back to the forest. On the field there were twelve burnt and knocked down German tanks and three of ours. In the evening we buried the dead. In the mass grave we lowered the bodies of Battalion Commissar Shepatov, Chief of Staff of the Regiment Captain Kashchiv and others, who had fallen by the death of brave men. The tankers stood over the grave with bare heads, in mournful silence, and still, though at an expensive price, the passage to Bogoroditskoy was opened. Now it is necessary to let the infantry into the breakthrough to organise the defence of the flanks, but there was confusion. Instead of infantry, the rear rushed into the breakthrough first, in a hurry to get out of the encirclement. Wagons, cars, and we clogged all the roads. In the woods we could hear the desperate swearing of drivers, the creaking of wagons, the neighing of horses. On this accumulation of transport was not slowed down by the enemy aviation. In addition, the enemy opened artillery and mortar fire. While the confusion was eliminated, the hard-won passage was closed again. We remained in the ravine southeast of Bogoroditsky. Meeting me, Pyotr Aleksevich said in his heart. Remibazov was right. We should have withdrawn the brigade immediately after the breakthrough and not delayed to let the infantry pass. We've only lost men for nothing. Ugh, and Solovyov spat vigorously. The next day in the morning a communications officer came to us with an order to collect all the tanks and concentrate them in the area of the army CP. The commander, the commissar and I were ordered to report to the commander for a meeting. Well, let's start all over again. Again dancing from the stove. Mimizov irritably remarked. When we arrived at the headquarters of the 19th Army, there was the commander, a member of the military council, several commanders and commissaries of compounds. Not far from the command post, in a clearing stood Po-2 aircraft. Its plane and fuselage were riddled with bullets and shrapnel. One wonders how after that it was possible to reach the command post and land the machines successfully. We were told that the pilot was pulled out of the cockpit in an unconscious state, he was wounded, and his strength left him. Barely the aircraft touched the ground with its wheels. The pilot delivered to the commander an order from the Stavka, which demanded that the army troops leave the encirclement in the direction of Jatsk. All material that could not be taken with them was ordered to be destroyed. Let's comrades discuss how best to fulfill the order, said General Lukin dryly. That's why I invited you. The opinions of those gathered were divided. Some proposed to destroy some of the vehicles and wagons at once, 
Others stood on not destroying anything and tried to take everything with them. There were also those who advised to fight their way in scattered small groups. Chino's last suggestion angered many. Piatu Olik Sivich elbowed me and whispered angrily. Oh, I leech, I'm itching to get my hands on panickers. General Lukin listened to all these statements glumly and silently. Then, seeing that business-like discussion of the issue was not possible, he slammed his hand on the table, stood up and said in a tone that allowed no objection, That's enough. We've talked enough. Unfold the maps and listen to my orders. We will break through Viasma place of concentration of units and formations after the breakthrough, in the forest south of the city, on the bank of the river Viasma, for the breakthrough to create a strike group, which includes all the available tanks, cavalry, hand and machine guns on vehicles. I appoint Major General Remizov as the commander of the strike group and Colonel Commissar Solovyov as the military commissar, all other formations and rear areas to move behind the strike group. Faulty equipment. Then the commander indicated the order and sequence of movement, set the time of performance, specified the route. For the strike group found only eight tanks, a hundred cavalrymen, several armoured cars and five six trucks with machine gunners. Rimazov and Solovyev stayed at the army CP to organise the strike group, and I went to the brigade, which was now temporarily commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Karshimnikov. We created a kind of rifle battalion out of the tankers who had lost their material. Communist Senior Lieutenant Yudin was appointed as a commander, and Pobedinsky as a military commander. The material part, which was under repair, was blown up and burnt. It was evening when General Remisov came to us. He was worried about his brigade. He approved our orders and move immediately after the strike group in an independent column through the village of Shutovo to Vyazma. Do not count on anyone. Judging by the last time we have in the army with cooperation out of hand badly, I don't want it to get hectic and disorganized again. And then the breakthrough began. Already clearly heard the sounds of a short distance battle. It's a strike group knocked down the enemy's forward defenses. We could not delay. Our column moved along the forest road. The night was restless. Now and then we had to deploy rifle chains to the right and left of the road, covering the movement of vehicles. The woods were filled with the crackle of machine gun bursts. Somewhere high up in the treetops, enemy mines were bursting, and fragments were raining down on the ground. Sometimes it came to hand grenades, especially in the settlements that were encountered on the way. It was difficult to lead a night battle in the forest. Success depended on the initiative and courage of the fighters, and our tankers showed themselves perfectly. We persistently fought our way forward. We passed the villages of Bukanovo, Efanovo, Lissa. Shooting was now heard mostly behind us. It seemed that we had broken out of the ring, and suddenly some commander appeared out of the darkness. Where is Lieutenant Colonel Karshevnikov? Hmm. He went ahead. What's the matter? The commander came closer, recognized me. It's bad, Comrade Battalion Commissar. The cars can't go any further. There's a ditch ahead. What ditch? I didn't understand. Oh, the anti-tank ditch dug against the Germans. It stretches in both directions for unknown how many kilometres, so you can't go around it. Together with the commander, I went to this ditch. Lieutenant Colonel Karshevnikov was already there and confidently ordered. She faster, faster, turn round. Fell this tree and this one. Collect saws and axes from all vehicles. Hurry up, damn it. A flare went off, illuminating the men at the bottom of the ditch and the cars that were huddled together. The gunfire behind us intensified. Mines began to burst again with a nasty hissing crack. So continue work, do not delay, shouted Karshevnikov. Yudin, where are you? Send two more platoons to cover the withdrawal. Stop, stop. You're putting the log wrong. Turn it round with the beam facing forwards. Oh, you rascals! Karchevnikov jumped into the ditch. That's how it's done. One, two, we got it. Next to me someone groaned. Someone called for the orderlies. Over us again and again rockets flew up. At last the bridge was built. Puffing Karshevnikov came up, stopped near me, wiped his face wet with sweat with a handkerchief and immediately shouted again in a hoarse, broken voice. Let the cars through. People, in the last turn. Comrade commanders, restore order. The traffic jam on the western side of the ditch began to dissolve quickly. I went to my car. Hmm. Comrade Kochetkov. 
I recognized Major Ampilogov, a rear worker of the brigade, by his voice. He was lying on the ground. When I approached him, Ampilogov say, Hmm, I've been wounded. I don't want to be a burden for my comrades, but I won't surrender as a prisoner. Here, take my party card. Meanwhile, our situation was far from hopeless. We put all the wounded on the cars. We managed to hold off the enemy's onslaught for the time being. Take away your party card, Ampilogov, E.I. said to the Major. Keep your hands to yourself. There is a captain here wounded in both hands, but he is not whimpering. He is not going to shoot himself. He walked halfway. We'll put you in the car now. Nobody is going to leave you, and you won't be a burden for your comrades. Two soldiers lifted the Major carefully. He's not that badly wounded. I think more frightened, whispered to me Grisha Sharendo. You should not think so badly about people, Grisha, I said. Well, confused man, what of it? Then he will come to his senses. I did not have time to finish, as there was a close burst of a mine. It hit the radiator of our car. Rising from the ground, I called Charent. Grisha, are you alive? And I've but wounded Dmitri Eilich. What a misfortune. While we and driver Natrasny dressing Grisha in the forest became quiet. All the cars had time to cross the ditch, apparently with Drew and cover fighters. We were left alone. Our car was mangled by a mine explosion. We had to go further on foot. We took assault rifles, duffel bags with food and supporting Sharendo under our arms, slowly moved along the shaky bridge over the ditch. The night was winding down. The brigade had already passed through the village of Zarichi and crossed the motorway Moscow-Minsk and we lagged behind. Cherendo could hardly move his legs. Somewhere on the right or on the left, there must be compounds of the 19th Army, which according to the breakthrough plan followed our brigade. But how could we find them? At dawn we saw a column of German tanks and motorized infantry catching up with us. We hid here at the roadside in a deep hole, covering it from above with piles of brushwood. The ground shook from the weight of passing tanks, sand was falling from the walls of the pit. We sat curled up in three dead bodies. Sharendo moaned in pain, but we could do nothing to help him. Sometimes he moaned so loudly that I had to put my palm over his mouth. When the column had passed, I peered out cautiously. A German wagon was now stretching along the road. Two motor cars were coming towards it, and the terrain was almost open. The nearest woods were at least a kilometre away. The traffic on the road did not stop until dark. Only at night we managed to get out of the hole. Legs got stiff, became like strangers. Grisha Sharendo left strength, and he lay on the ground for several minutes. And it was impossible to delay. Natruzny and I picked up Grisha and, staggering, as drunk, slowly wandered towards the forest. In the night sky, rockets were taking off. At first it frightened us, and we lay down every time they flashed. But then we stopped paying attention to them, and hurried to reach the forest faster. It was already light when we reached the edge of the forest. They crammed into a dense bush, lay down on the cold, damp ground strewn with leaves. We had to be alert, but sleep overcame us. We took turns, pushing each other to keep awake. I was lying on my back. Through the yellowed leaves of the shrubbery I could see the sky, coloured pink by dawn. A little bird perched on a branch half a metre from my face, tilted its head to the side, looked at me with its beady black eyes, and whistled cheerfully. My watch stopped. I don't know how long we lay in a half-sleep in the bushes before the shots of German machine guns were heard. Probably the Nazis began to comb the forest. Natrusny got scared. Nerdo. Tick KM, Commissar? There's nowhere to tick, my friend. There's an open field behind us. And Sharendo can't move fast enough. We'll lie down, and if they find us, we'll shoot to the last bullet. We got two machine guns. I pulled out my gun and put it in front of me. We're holding our breath. Maybe they won't notice? The bushes rattled under someone's heavy footsteps. I grabbed the gun, clutching its rough grip in my sweaty palm. I felt a little calmer, more confident. Twenty metres away, a German soldier came out from behind a tree. His big red hands rested on the automatic rifle. I aim at the enemy's chest, just below and to the right of the second button on his cushy uniform. The German, looking round carefully, has noticed us. For a moment our gazes met, an animal fear flashed in the Nazi's eyes. I fired. The Nazi grabbed his chest and collapsed to the ground. Hmm, not it's a piss of fascist. Natrusny whispered triumphantly. 
Among the machine gun bursts the single, soft shot of my pistol was lost. But the danger was still great. Hitlerites passed and ran quite close by. Only by happy chance nobody else came upon us. And finally there was silence, as if everything around had died out. Trying not to make any noise, we got out of the bushes. A Red Army soldier was lying under a tall tree, as if asleep, with his head resting on the butt of his pee. Wait, comrades, I said. We must look, maybe he is not killed but wounded. I went forward, bent over the lying soldier. He was not breathing. Stop and don't move. Hmm. A stern but commanding voice sounded behind me. Without unbending, I slowly turned my head. Nearby stood my familiar company political officer self It's you, comrade battalion commissar. He exclaimed joyfully, lowering his weapon. That's great. With Savkin was up to a dozen fighters. He said that during the battle for the village of Zarekhi, he together with a small group of Red Army soldiers had been cut off from their own. Now the march became more cheerful. Before evening we were joined by forty more fighters and commanders. We formed a small but effective detachment. I did not suppose that I could use the experience gained in the first days of the war. I appointed political officer Savkin Commissar of the detachment, allocated a reconnaissance department headed by Lieutenant F. Stafiv and a group for food procurement. Sharendo was carried by four soldiers on a cloak tent, carried, falling into the swamp, stumbling over bumps, cursing the Nazi invaders. Every 150, 200 meters the porters changed. Richer felt his condition hard. He kept trying to walk without the help of his comrades, but his wound was heavy besides it festered. At times Chorendo lost consciousness. As soon as they passed the swamp, they had to lie down in the bushes, hiding from the Nazis who were combing the forest. Hitlerites were many. They came to the edge of the forest, as scouts reported to me, on several cars, all armed with machine guns, and we were saving ammunition for the decisive moment, for the breakthrough through the front line. The fascists are on the prowl everywhere, shooting can be heard. Solitary fighters and maybe small spontaneous groups are hiding in the forest. They are the enemy's victims. We can't help our comrades. The forces are too unequal. To engage in battle is to lose lives in vain. To my left there was a crackle of dead wood. Someone was running through the bushes. I became wary, pressed the butt of my automatic rifle more tightly to my shoulder. I saw a tall commander with a grenade and a pistol in his hands. His face seemed familiar to me, but afraid of being mistaken. I loudly whispered a command, as an all, lie down. The commander stopped and suddenly smiled broadly. No de dead, Koshetkov. It was my old comrade from my work in the political department of the front battalion Commissar Chubchenko. But how he had changed. No wonder that I did not immediately recognize him. Chubchenko had lost weight, his face had become puffy and glowed unhealthy yellow. We embraced. With difficulty catching his breath, Chubchenko interrupted voice briefly told that their small group was discovered by the Nazis. A firefight ensued, in which the battalion Commissar Litkin and several Red Army soldiers were killed. The rest scattered through the forest. Our soft conversation was interrupted by footsteps. We fell silent, taking up our weapons again. A few meters away from us, four SS men came into the clearing, stopped, whispered. One of them took out a cigarette case from the side pocket of his uniform, which glistened in the sun. The soldiers smoked, talked about something else and went on. The bluish smoke of cigarettes hung between the trees. After the excitement I had experienced, I had an irresistible urge to smoke. Without thinking about it, I pulled a piece of newspaper out of my pocket, a kit set, and began to roll up a goat's leg. Are you out of your mind? The smoke will spot us at once, whispered Chubchenko, tightly squeezing my hand. Mahorka spilled out onto the grass. I looked at it with regret, but Chubchenko was right. By evening the fascists left. It was possible to continue the journey. But before we had to gather people and have a snack with what God sent. Actually with food was very bad. We ate what we could and when we could. Everyone pierced new holes in their belts. The villages we met were looted by Hitlerites or burnt down. Our loggers did not always manage to get even potatoes. Sharendo and Chubchenko felt bad. Grisha's wound did not stop festering and healed slowly. Maybe it was because the bandages were torn, to put it mildly, not too clean underwear. Chubchenko was ill with some disease unknown to me, which was aggravated by systematic malnutrition.
he became completely unrecognizable, his face even more swollen and yellowed. One day three tankers joined the detachment. They brought five kilograms of raw horse meat and shared it with everyone. We built small fires in the forest and started to grill shashlik. The tough meat without salt, smelling of smoke, seemed surprisingly tasty to us. After a relatively nourishing meal, we wanted to smoke. There was still some flavor dust in my kit set. I began to search my pockets for a scrap of newspaper and pulled out a crumpled envelope with a letter I had forgotten about. This letter had come at the end of September from the wife of Major Kowalewski, who had been killed in action. I thought that now it would be very convenient to read the letter to the tired, hungry, but not submitted to the enemy Soviet fighters. Simple, coming from the heart, excited words of Larissa Kowalewskaya called for revenge, fueled hatred to Hitlerites. A few hours ago, I received the terrible news that my husband was killed, wrote Larisa Vadimirovna. In this war, I lost my father, brother, and now my beloved husband. My children were left orphans. We barely managed to save ourselves. To evacuate from Minsk, the widow of Major Kowalewski urged the soldiers and commanders to avenge her husband's death for the grief and suffering that the fascists brought to the Soviet people. Be merciless to the enemy. Always remember that victory is ours. That's how she ended her letter. I read and saw that they were listening to me attentively, concentrated. The fighters' faces were stern, thoughtful. Probably they were thinking at these moments about their families, so close and so far away. The dissipations of Jonas of one of the collective farms gave us a horse with a saddle. The horse is old. It has an eyesore on its eye. Ribs stick out like hoops on a barrel. And yet some of the Red Army men looked at it bloodthirstily, remembering the recent keep. I did not allow the horse to be wasted. It was now ridden in turn by Sherendo and Shibchenko. The horse rode at a leisurely lurching pace. But it suited us quite well. Anyway, the detachment was moving quite slowly. But here is the cut of the map that I have preserved. There was no next sheet. We had to walk further, determining the direction by compass, asking the local population. By evening, we reached a small village. Smoke was rising from the chimneys of some houses. The wind carried the faint smell of fresh bread. We swallowed our saliva, but we did not dare to go into the village at once. We sent a scout there. Having returned, the scouts reported that the Hitlerites had left the village. Only two soldiers remained. I called Deputy Political Officer Talyatinov, a man of great courage. We must capture these fascists. Take three Red Army men with you and act. Yes. Talyatinov replied briefly, and in his narrow black eyes a bad light flashed. An hour later, the deputy political officer brought the prisoners. Mere comrade commissar, he said, without going into details, and threw the trophies on the grass. Two automatic rifles, a flask and two Macintoshes. The prisoners were trembling with fear, saying senselessly Hitler kaput. I expected to interrogate them, but none of us knew German. In the village we got some meat, peas, flour, salt. For the sick Chubchenko, we got two chickens and several bottles of milk. On the 30th of October, it snowed. Winter came early that year. As we climbed deep into the forest to make a break in a relatively safe place, we heard a cheerful song. It was sung by the tinkling voices of children. We went in the direction where the melody was coming from, and soon we met five boys of about 10 or 12 years old. It turned out that they were deliberately walking through the forest and singing loudly to attract the attention of the Red Army and warned them about the appearance of a large German unit in the neighboring village. We praised the boys for their ingenuity. They promised to bring milk for Chupchenko and to us Makorka and Salt. Waiting for the boys to return, the fighters laid down under the trees right on the frozen ground and immediately fell asleep. I too lay down under a cloak tent. I could not sleep. I was tormented by thoughts, whether the children would not arouse suspicion of Hitlerites, whether they would not be caught when they went to the forest again. But everything turned out safely. The boys brought three bottles of milk, salt, and fodder poured into the case of a pocket electric torch. A few more days passed. The last piece of chicken was left. I cooked broth for Chubchenko myself, but he refused to eat. He was not well at all. So, oh, leave me in the village with the collective farmers. We begged. Anyway, I will not get there. I didn't agree. Be strong, Alexei. The hardest part is behind you. Soon we'll put you in hospital. Chubchenko shook his head languidly. He had no strength to argue. 
6 November, approached the River Rusa. It flowed leisurely between the gentle, overgrown willow banks. The leaves had long ago fallen off the willow trees, the wind whistled in the bare branches, the water in the river was leaden, unfriendly, covered with a thin, glass-like ice crust at the banks. The thought of wading in such water made one shiver. Beyond the river, on a hill, the village of Sutuki could be seen. From there came the screams of women, the shrill squeal of piglets and the clucking of frightened hens. There was some bustle in the streets. I raised my binoculars to my eyes. That's right, it was Hitler's soldiers engaged in robbery. They caught chickens and piglets, dragged them into cars. When the fascists left, we soon found the ford by the traces of cart wheels, breaking off at the water's edge. Not far from the shore, in a dilapidated barn, the soldiers found eight horses, which the collective farmers had hidden from the Germans. We decided to use them for crossing. The first to cross the river was Chubchenko on horseback on our detachment Nag. I did not want to let him go ahead, but he insists. The ford has not been explored. I'll check it out. I can swim, and then Eid Chubchenko did not finish, but it was clear to me what he wanted to say. He always felt like a burden to the squad. The crossing took more than an hour. The ford was deep. In some places the water was up to the horse's withers. Lieutenant F. Steifeev and Deputy Political Commander Talyatinov could not hold on and fell off their horses into the river. They got ashore, soaked to the skin. In the penetrating wind their wet clothes were covered with ice. Strange that nowhere was not Chubchenko, although everyone saw how he safely crossed. Where is he? Didn't something happen to him? I was worried about Alexei Mikhailovich. In his condition, it's not easy to endure a cold bath. Evstaifayev and Talyatanov were pitiful to look at. The tall Evstaifayev was sniffing his blue nose in a childish way. Talyatanov could not stop trembling. His teeth were clattering incessantly. Shall we go to Satuki and get warm, comrade commissar? Evstaifayev begged. Politruk Savkin supported it. Indeed, we must risk it. Otherwise people will catch cold. We headed towards the village through snow-covered vegetable gardens. On the outskirts of the village we noticed a bathhouse, beside which was tied up our white-haired mare. With her head down, she indifferently nibbled the stale grass with her long yellow teeth. Is not here Chupchenko, I thought. From the half-open door of the bathhouse was pulling a bluish smoke. It was stoked black. Sliding the safety of the automatic rifle, I squeezed through the narrow door. Two men, dirty, ragged, and stripped to the waist, were sitting on the board floor by the stove. With their shirts on their knees, they were catching lice. Hmm, who are they? I asked. What do you care? One of the strangers asked in turn, looking at me warily and glumly. If Stifeev and Talyatanov squeezed into the bathhouse after me. The voices of the approaching fighters were heard behind the doors. Strangers realized that there was nothing to hide in front of them were their own. I am political officer Yushikov from the 177th Rifle Division, said a gaunt, long, unshaven man. Pointing at his comrade, he added, And this is a platoon commander from our division. We are sneaking to our own, through the front. Elements? I demanded. Hmm, give me a knife, Vasily. Hmm, said the one whom Ushakov called the platoon commander. Yushikov handed him a penknife. Ripping open the lining of his trousers, the commander pulled out a party card and an identity card. Ushakov also pulled out his documents from the rags. They were in perfect order. Hmm, take us into your squad, comrade battalion commissar, asked Yushakov. It is difficult to go alone. All right, we'll take you into the detachment. But tell me, have you seen one of our comrades? How did our horse end up here by the bathhouse? Ushakov said, that about an hour ago, some completely exhausted military man, judging by his appearance, a commander, rode up to the bathhouse. He didn't dismount, he just fell off his horse. We carried him to the outer house. He is there now, said Yushikov. I immediately went to the house. Chubchenko was lying there on a hot cooker, and for the first time in many days really rested. It turned out that he had already agreed with the owner, Fedor Vasilyevich Eremenko, that he would stay with him. Where would he go so ill? A confirmed Fyodor Vasilievich. Let him lie down. I'll marry him off as my brother, Alexei, too. I'll tell him that he came from Vyazma and was in prison under the Soviet regime. I said yes with a heavy heart. Chubchenko looked very bad. There was little hope that he would endure to the end of our difficult journey. 
Political officer Savkin came, taking under the visor. Report. We got some food, comrade battalion commissar. Savkin was strictly officious. He always, in any conditions with emphasized punctuality, fulfilled the requirements of the regulations, tried to show himself a real military bone. It is impossible to linger in the village. Soon dawn and in the morning usually come Hitlerites, settled in the neighboring forest, and commit robbery. Shubchenko and I hugged each other. Parted perhaps forever. No thank you for everything. Meche said Alexei Mikhinovich, mm, for care, for help. If you successfully get out of the encirclement, tell your friends how it was. I was tormented by the thought of whether I was doing the right thing, leaving my comrade in the care of the peasants. Shubchenko felt it. They did not think about anything. He tried to reassure me. Everything is done correctly, otherwise it is impossible. And I am not my own enemy, we wail goodbye. We hugged once more. In the yard, Fyodor Vasilyevich buried in the shed uniforms, documents and party card Shubchenko. It's all right. Maybe it will be all right, he said to me. I'm going out your friend, and then look, and you'll come back. Not a century here will be fascists. The detachment is already gathered. To my surprise, the shoulders of the soldiers and commanders are pulled back by heavy duffel bags. Two big sacks are strapped to the saddle of our horse. Merson to report, comrade battalion commissar. The products were received legally, explained Savkin. The local population gave them quite voluntarily, considering that otherwise everything would go to the enemy, in addition to potatoes, bread, salt and other things. The collective farmers gave us two heifers. Now we had quite a solid stock of food, and we could really celebrate the great holiday, the 24th anniversary of the October Revolution. In the morning we slaughtered a heifer and boiled potato soup with meat. The men pulled themselves up without orders, put themselves in order if possible. Politruk Savkin rubbed his broken boots with the hollow of his overcoat long and diligently. I held a conversation about the anniversary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. I spoke about those difficult years, when the troops of 14 countries were attacking the young Soviet Republic. We withstood then, defeated the enemy. We will win now, despite the failures in the first months of the war. A day later, on a clear, frosty night, we heard the clattering of machine guns. We were at the very front line. But how does it run? Is it solid? Where is the best place to break through? I sent Talyatanov with two Red Army men to reconnoiter. In an empty village, the detachment stopped for a last halt behind enemy lines. We were joined by several other small groups of fighters and commanders. Now there were about 70 men in the detachment. All had weapons, but not enough ammunition. Before the performance gathered the detachment in a stone shed on the outskirts of the village. Do you hear machine gun fire? We are at the front line, I said. It means that the enemy is stopped near Moscow, that Hitlerite's boastful statements about the fall of our capital are a brazen lie, but a heavy, unequal battle may be waiting for us. We must be ready for it. And here I say to you, comrades, whoever is a coward, let him stay. One coward or a panic-stricken man can ruin the whole unit. Someone's voice from the depths of the barn confidently muttered. There are none. All cowards have gone before. A discreet murmur of approval swept through the ranks of the soldiers. Every now and then I looked at my watch. The reconnaissance still hasn't returned. The lights of cigarettes are turning red. The soldiers are also impatiently waiting for the return of the scouts. I came out of the barn. At the edge of the village, squeaking on the snow with torn boots, a sentry walks by. No one. Not yet, having understood my thoughts. The fighter answers and suddenly stops, touches me by the sleeve of his overcoat. It seems that they are coming. That's right. Three men are approaching us. I recognize the stocky figure of Talyatanov. He's almost running. What happened? Are not the fascists chasing them? Flashed an alarming thought. But Talyatanov saw me, and waving his arms excitedly, shouted at the top of his voice. I met Comrade Commissar. We've reached our own. The frontier is not solid. Behind my back there was a friendly, loud, joyful hurrah, squeezing and pushing each other like schoolchildren at recess. The soldiers jumped out of the barn. Noise, fun, shouts, laughter. Swing the scouts, someone suggested amid laughter. I called Talyatano. Report in detail on the results of the reconnaissance. Are you sure that we really came to our own? Hmm, I'm sure, comrade battalion commissar. 
Here, look. Mark Kalyatanov pulled out a fresh issue of the newspaper Krasnaya Zevida from his pocket. Somehow it turned out that we are in a corridor. To the right and left are Germans, behind two, and in front ours. In the village where we were yesterday, the fascists drove in two cars, stayed a bit and left. But our cavalrymen keep stopping by. They're about three kilometers away. So we were very lucky. This is a village of Psyche is full of cavalrymen. All of them are well dressed, in half fur coats, fur hats, valenki. And we flaunted in summer gymnases and trousers and got so accustomed that we didn't even suffer from cold. Oh, the Russian man is hardy. The cavalrymen generously treated us with breadcrumbs and makorka. I sought out the regiment commander and introduced myself. He told me that his unit was part of General Dovater's cavalry corps. Hmm. I advise you and your detachment to go to the neighbouring village of Yazvish. They're the headquarters and political department of our division, said the regiment commander. After a little rest, we moved to Yazvishai. The political department of the division was located in a spacious peasant house. I was talking to the chief when the door opened and a short, broad-shouldered general, quite young, about 38 years old, entered the room. Everyone stood up. The general said hello, threw off his mossy burka and put his cap on the table. This was the corps commander, Major General Lev Mikhailovich Dovater. His attentive gaze stopped on me. I report he. Murty comrade general. Battalion Commissar Kachetkov, head of the political department of the 127th Tank Brigade. Very well, the Dovater said curtly. We need tanks. Where is the brigade? And why are you in such an unsightly form? I briefly told about the fate of the brigade. Dovater listened without interrupting, pacing the room with quick steps and biting his thin lips. Well, Mite, we said W when I finished telling. You've come out of the enemy's rear and we're just about to go there. Show us how you moved. The general unfolded the map on the table, leaned over it, smoothing his short hair. We talked for about thirty minutes. Dovater ordered to feed our detachment, give people makorka and a hundred grams of vodka. I was invited to his place for lunch. At lunch he said, Hey, do not linger here, move faster to Istra. The enemy is trying to cut the Volokonsko highway. From the village of Yazvishia to Istra on the highway is more than 40 kilometers. We arrived in Istra at night. The detachment was housed in the school building on Lenin Square. All at once in a huddle lay down on the floor. Only the watchman, struggling with sleep, stoked the cookers. In the morning, after a talk in the special department, we were sent out of town, where one of the rest houses housed a sorting station. We passed through the whole of Istra. It is a small but clean and beautiful town. In summer, it is drowned in greenery. Now there is heavy snow on trees on roofs of houses. Fed army soldiers and junior commanders stayed at the sorting station. The middle commanders and political workers were ordered to go to Moscow, to the headquarters of the Western Front. Such orders are familiar to me. So the carriages of the suburban train are packed beyond all norms. We can barely squeeze in, and all the way to Moscow we stand in the aisle, squeezed from all sides, shuffling from foot to foot, just like before the war in the tram during rush hours. In Moscow, at the railway station, we had white buns with sausage. It's been a long time since we've eaten good things. Carendo decided to go to the military commandant and get a referral to the hospital. It was time for us to part. That's what war is, sir. Unexpected meetings, unexpected partings. I was to go near Moscow, to the village of Yubori, to the reserve of the political department of the Western Front. Cherendo and I left the commandant, stopped on the square, hugged each other for the last time. I went to the entrance of the Belorusky railway station. At the door looked back. Grisha stood, leaning on a stick at the place where we parted, and waved to me. In Yubori, at the house, which housed the personnel department, crowded political workers, some in civilian clothes. These were people who had come out of the encirclement. They let me into the hut only on call, but I did not wait. The duty officer, a junior political officer, tried to stop me. You are not summoned, wait. I dismissed him and opened the door to the room where the personnel officers were working. Hello, friends. Battalion Commissar Koshetkov has arrived at your disposal. Everyone jumped out of their seats. Friendly handshakes began, questions were asked. I had lunch, of course, together with my friends. At the table sat Zaslavsky, Zikov, Igolnikov, and others. As diplomats say, the lunch was held in a warm and friendly atmosphere. 
The chief of the reserve, Battalion Commissar Truskov, was ordered to issue me with uniforms and enroll me in the first company. I was settled in a house of two rooms. In one lived the owner's family, in the other two battalion commissars. Throwing my duffel bag under the bunk, I sat down to the table and got acquainted with my comrades. One of them was a rather silent, uncommunicative man. He was lying on the bunk with his hands under his head, smoking incessantly. Apparently, he had been through a lot in recent months, and the hardships of the front had left a strong imprint on him. The second, battalion commissar Anatoly Leontievich Truskov, I immediately liked. We somehow easily talked, feeling sympathy for each other. Truskov was the commissar of the headquarters of the 126th Tank Brigade and had recently come out of the encirclement. In the evening, uninvited but welcome guests came to me. Political workers of our brigade, Emelianko, Lebedev, Savev. They brought several bottles of wine, some snacks. The room immediately became crowded, noisy and cheerful. Our conversation dragged on into the night. My comrades had also had a lot of hardship when they came out of the encirclement near Vyazma. By the way, they reported that Rimaizov and Solovyev are alive and well, and are somewhere in the neighbourhood of Perkushkovo. But nothing was known about Commander Lukin. Only after the war I managed to learn about the difficult fate of the general, fighting his way out of the encirclement with a small group of soldiers and commanders, if Lukin was wounded first in the arm and then in the leg. Unconscious and bleeding, he was taken prisoner. He came to his senses already in a fascist hospital. His arm and leg were amputated. Hitlerites repeatedly offered the Soviet general to go to their service, but each time Mikhail Fedorovich angrily and resolutely refused. Fascists for a long time kept Lukin in a fortress prison, Würzburg. During almost four years of captivity, M. F. Lukin remained a faithful son of the party and the motherland. Now Lieutenant General Lukin is retired, lives in Moscow. From the stories of friends, I became clearer picture of the battles near Vyazma. We suffered a major setback in these battles. The enemy managed to break through the entire operational depth of the front of our defence, which covered the shortest routes to Moscow from the west and southwest. A significant part of the troops defending in this area fell into the encirclement and came out of it in scattered groups. Stubborn fighting continued until mid-October. The gap, punched by the enemy in our defence, was closed with great difficulty. For me began boring days of languishing in the reserve. Exactly idle, otherwise you can't call it. Every clerk of the reserve headquarters considered himself our chief. In general, as I noticed, some clerks, chauffeurs from the cars of senior commanders and cooks very quickly begin to forget military discipline. A week later I was called by the chief of personnel Zaslavsky and offered to go with him to the first echelon of the front headquarters in Perkushkovo. Dear Zaslavsky, say, Lestev is interested in you. I reported to him about your arrival. He was pleased, he said. In Perkushkovo I met up with old friends. There were Razgovorov, Rudakov, Moknashev, Rodionov, Podobed, Sharov. Many of them had military order. I went to the head of the agitation and propaganda department, Bannock. He met me friendly, sat me down, asked to tell me about everything in detail. But when I told him about Chubchenko, Bannock changed his tear. Say that you abandoned in the rear Chubchenko will be immediately reported to Lestiv. You had no right to do so. I could hardly restrain myself not to be rude in response to such reproaches. Rising. You needn't trouble yourself. I myself will report to the divisional commissar how it was. Soon I was summoned by Lestiv. We talked for over an hour. Bannock was also present. When I began to tell about Chubchenko, Bannock tried to put in a word, probably to reproach me once again, but Lestiv did not let him speak. I realize that you wanted to make the best of it, fearing for Chubchenko's life, said Lestiv after a little thought. But still, perhaps, you should not have left him behind enemy lines. Already after the conversation with Bannock, I realized that I would have to tell about Chubchenko many times to explain how it all came about. I still believed that I did the right thing, but I decided for myself. I will try to help Alexei. He is probably a little better now, and he can be led through the front. Allow me to create a small group of those who with me came out of the encirclement and go to the rear of the enemy for Chubchenko. I asked Lestev. Divisional Commissar looked at me carefully, nodded his head. In principle, I do not object. But wait, I'll contact the head of intelligence. 
Listeff picked up the phone and talked on the phone for about ten minutes. I was understandably anxious to hear the end of the conversation, hanging up the phone, the divisional commissar say. The head of the intelligence department believes that you yourself to go is unnecessary. Our scouts will do it better themselves. But you should definitely visit the reconnaissance department, explain how and where to go. At the end of the conversation, Lestiv offered me to work in the political department as an inspector. I refuse. Hmm. Send me to the tank unit. A familiar conversation. You, it turns out, do not change. Grinned, Lestiv. All right. I won't force you. Rest for a few days and then you'll get your assignment. I left Lestiv warmed by his attention and sensitivity, but still dissatisfied that I do not have to go after Chubchenko. If they think that I made a mistake, then I myself should correct it, I thought. Suddenly I was called by name. I turned round and saw Volodya Dubrov, the inspector of the political department. I saw him last time when I came to Perkushkovo from my brigade, and he was going to Boldin's group. In a month and a half, Volodya had lost a great deal of weight and had become gaunt. Only his big bright eyes, as before, shone brightly. In September, in the group of General Boldin, Dubrov was appointed commissar of the 151st Rifle Division. This compound showed in the battles of great resilience and organization, but on 13 October the division headquarters was suddenly attacked by the enemy and cut off from the units. Ten days the detachment, consisting of staff commanders and fighters of service units, made its way to the front line, with fights people passed 350 kilometers. From a hundred people remained a little more than 30. October 24, Dybrov with his group went to the defense of the 17th Rifle Division of the 16th Army. That's how things are, Dmitri, said Dybrov. Well, and how are you? I had to tell about my adventures behind enemy lines. Our conversation was interrupted by a telephone call. I was invited by the head of the intelligence department of the front headquarters. Then we went to the scouts. The reconnaissance unit was located in a Dutcher-type spacious house with a mezzanine. For a trip to the rear of the enemy selected 15 people, including two girls who knew well Shakovskaya district. I explained to them in detail how to get to the village where Chopchenko is located. Of course, the scouts went to the rear not only for Alexei Mikhailovich. They had their own task, and help him was, so to speak, a matter of incidental. Later I learnt that the scouts failed to meet with Chupchenko. Having recovered a little from the illness and getting stronger, he said goodbye to Fedor Vasilievich Eremenko and his wife Antonina Alexeevna and left the village. Having safely crossed the front line, Alexei Mikhailovich arrived at the political department. In July 1957, I received a letter from retired Colonel M. Chubchenko. He reported in particular that Fedor Vasilievich Eremenko died at the front in April 1943 charging from the scouts in Perkushkovo. I remembered that somewhere here must be Remizov and Solovyov. I did not manage to meet General Remizov, but I saw Pyotr Alexeevich. There seemed to be no end to mutual questions and stories. Here I learnt about the misfortunes of the 19th Army. The strike group, led by Remizov and Solovyov, its difficult task was fulfilled. The breakthrough was made, but all the equipment had to be abandoned. Further, Remizov's group was cut off from the army formations, which, not feeling centralized control, began to break through each at their own risk. With great difficulty, after many days of marching through the enemy rear, the remnants of the shock group on the 6th of November caught up in the area of Narofominsk, the front that had rolled back. Pyotr Aksevich told about all this in detail and interestingly. Then he asked, Where are you going to be sent? I don't know. I asked Le Steve to send me to a tank unit, he promised. So far I'm sitting waiting for the weather. Solovyev sighed. I'm also waiting for an assignment. I'm in agony. The situation is alarming. The Germans are marching on Moscow, and here you are idle as in a resort. It was already getting lighter outside the window. We lay with Pyotr Aksevich on the wooden master's bed and smoked. Sleep had finally passed. Each of us was thinking about a layer, about what we had experienced. For four months, the war had been going on. During this time, I got into encirclement twice and spent 70 days in the rear of the enemy. Hitler writes near Moscow, the situation is difficult, but the most difficult thing we survived, we withstood a surprise attack. Hey, this will not happen again. I said out loud. Pyotr Alexeevich turned his head to me. What did you say? 
Without answering him, I took a new cigarette out of the packet.